trivia question. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. I'm excited to have this team here with us today. Um, welcome to HMSC's monthly virtual science on tap. I hope you're someplace uh, where there's good food and you're comfortable and there's good drink. Um, my name is Cinnamon Moffitt and I'm the research program manager at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center in Newport, Oregon. And I will be your host for tonight's event. Um, this is a webinar and so your mics, camera and screen shares are disabled. But if you haven't seen us doing it already, uh, we really encourage you to participate with us using the chat, which you can find at the bottom or the top of your screen, depending on your um, format that you're using. And if you click on that, you'll get a little pop-up box and you're welcome to put questions in there um, anytime throughout this presentation. And we'll get to those, um, answering those questions at the end. Uh, I also wanted to let folks know that we are recording tonight's event. So if you miss something or you wanna share it with others, um, it will go on the HMSC's past seminar page in a couple of days. It takes me a few days to get everything processed. Um, and I'm putting that link into the chat right now. Um, but if you want to share it, you're welcome to do so. I also wanted to promote next month's Virtual Science on Tap. We have Jack Barth, who will be talking about the iconic journey of the Western Flyer, which is the vessel from John Steinbeck and Ed Ricketts book, Log of the Sea of Cortez, which kind of changed the direction of marine ecology. So we're excited to kind of have this uh, slightly different view of uh, marine science uh, focused around uh, literary um, epic book. So it'll be really exciting to um, hear what Jack has to say. And if you'd like to find out anything about our uh, upcoming events, if you just Google or whatever platform you use, HMSC, log to the bottom or scroll to the bottom of our page and you'll see a calendar of events there. Um, but while you're all here for tonight, um, we have three amazing speakers for you. So I'm going to do a quick introduction and I'll hand it off to them so we can get into the meat of why we're all here. So first of all, we have um, Charlie Plybon, who is the Oregon Policy Manager for Surfrider Foundation. He serves on the state's Ocean Policy Advisory Council, where he's currently the chair of the Rocky Habitat Management Strategy Working Group. That's a little bit of a mouthful for Charlie's title. Um, we also have Andy Lanier, who is the Marine Affairs Coordinator with Oregon Coast Man Management Program in the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development. He is a graduate of the Marine Resources Man Management Master's Degree Program at Oregon State University. We also have Michael Moses, who is a graduate of CO um, Marine Management Marine Resource Management Master's Program at OSU, as well as OSU's Fisheries and Wildlife. He has worked and volunteered for many of the OSU laboratories and organizations, including 10 years of seasonal offshore work for PISCO and the RV Ilaka. He now works for the Rocky Shores Coordinator at the Department of Land Conservation and Development. So I'm very excited to have all three of these speakers here today and I'm gonna hand the floor and I think Charlie's gonna kick us off. So I'm gonna hand it to Charlie. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Cinnamon. Um, and thanks to the folks at Science on Tap for having us. Uh, yes, my name is Charlie Plab and I am the Oregon Policy Manager for Surfrider Foundation. Um, I'm, I'm here uh, and talking to you this evening with my Ocean Policy Advisory Council hat on. Um, and as, as Cinnamon mentioned, I'm chairing a, a working group uh, of the Ocean Policy Advisory Council. Uh, I've been doing that actually for the past three years, believe it or not, to try and uh, update Oregon's territorial sea plan that manages our rocky habitats. So really important areas up and down our coast, both along the shoreline and also submerged. Uh, and um, we've been at a pretty big, long, extensive public process um, to update a strategy that's been nearly 30 years out of date. Um, I would like to turn it over quickly to have uh, my colleagues here, Moses, um, uh, introduce himself and where he fits into this, as well as Andy to give you a little bit more background maybe on the Oregon Coastal Management Program. So Moses. Great, thank you. Hi everybody, uh, Michael Moses. I think I, I see some familiar names there in the attendee list. So many of you know me, but for those who don't, uh, I go by Mike, Michael, Moses, hey you, stop that, whatever works, um, but most people tend to call me Moses. Uh, I'm currently the uh, Rocky Shores Coordinator at the Department of Land Conservation and Development, so Andy and I uh, work at the same agency, and uh, I came in in the middle of this process uh, with some big shoes to fill, 
And uh, so I, I picked up the torch here and then I'm helping to oversee and coordinate uh, this project that, that Charlie mentioned. So that's updating how the state of Oregon manages our, our rocky shores, our rocky habitats along the coast. And so that, that project is a multi-year project. Uh, it'll conclude uh, later this year in the fall. And uh, so we're, we're coming to uh, some crucial points in the process now. So we're really excited uh, to be able to come here today and share with you what's been going on and, and really what we're looking for in the future, what, what we hope to achieve uh, down the line here with this project. So Andy, Thank I'm you, Moses. Here, yeah, I'll just uh, briefly introduce myself. Um, as Cinnamon said, I'm the Marine Affairs Coordinator for the Department of Land Conservation and Development. Um, we, as a, as a coastal program in the state, are Oregon's federally approved coastal zone management program. So while it is housed within our department, we actually have, uh, you know, include other agencies with their statutory authorities and the enforceable policies. And we ensure that um, the state of Oregon has a say uh, when decisions are being made within our coastal zone uh, that relate to uh, the implementation of those policies. Uh, specifically the ocean resources goal, goal 19, uh, sets out kind of the foundational state policy. Uh, and that goal has been implemented traditionally through uh, the amendment and the, the addition to the territorial sea plan or the maintenance of that plan over time. So that's really what we're talking about today. Uh, my role is that I staff the Ocean Policy Advisory Council. So I, I help Charlie and Michael with their working group as well as help to coordinate uh, the work of the council and, and help them to conduct their business. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Charlie. Thanks. And just to, you know, as a little context, the Ocean Policy Advisory Council uh, is made up of a number of different um, government interests and agencies, First Nations, as well as um, various ocean stakeholders like recreational users. And they advise the governor on keeping up to date the territorial sea plan. This is what we're talking about tonight. So getting a little bit more into the heart of the program and what I will be talking about, one, why are Rocky habitats? Why do we have a special chapter in our territorial sea plan dedicated to Rocky habitats? We'll talk a little bit more about that, how they're managed um, and then more detail about exactly how that fits into the context of a territorial sea plan. Um, we'll talk about area-based management and, and special designations uh, and a current process that's happening underway for that, um, as well as uh, demonstrate for you guys a new tool, uh, a digitized rocky habitat inventory and public proposal tool um, for adding new area-based designations. Um, and then hopefully we'll spend the bulk of our time spending, um, answering some questions and engaging you guys in some discussion uh, around the update process. So first off, why rocky habitats? Uh, why dedicate a whole part of the territorial sea plan to rocky habitats? Well, because they're ecologically important and they're culturally important for a lot of different reasons. Um, and just as a quick starter, how many guys know or how many of those species can you name in it's on the screen right now. Go ahead and just start dropping them into the chat if you know them. Let's see how informed our audience is. These are pretty common ones that you would see in Oregon's near shore in our rocky habitat. Yeah, we've got purple sea urchin, black oyster catcher, we've got the ochre star, the very prominent green sea anemones. So again, a lot of familiar species, a lot of familiarity in the Rocky Shore to Oregonians and to a lot of folks. Um, number one, access and education. Uh, it's, it's not that often that in Oregon that we have an opportunity to get people right down to the near shore and right next to the ocean and see a vast array of different species and um, the Rocky habitat allows us that access. Um, so it's a critical area for us to learn about the ocean. Uh, for many people, this is the first place that they've ever visited uh, when on a school trip. They learned about tide pools. They learned about the rocky intertidal area. They learned about keystone species. Um, it's such a significant area for, for individuals to really learn uh, and explore the shoreline. They're ecologically significant. We know that these are really resilient habitats uh, on the edge of a pretty um, powerful ocean. 
Uh, they have amazing adaptations, the animals in the intertidal in particular that spend half their day out of the water and half their day underwater. Um, all kinds of extremes that these animals um, are exposed to in plants as well. A great opportunity for us to learn about resiliency and adaptation to climate change um, as some of these species are, are constantly uh, faced with these sorts of pressures. There's sentinel sites for research. The rocky habitat, this dashing young man and his dashing young lady um, are doing ocean acidification research at Otter Rock. Um, and the intertidal area is, we often think about the folks here in Oregon, uh, in OSU and, and, and the universities here around our state that, that really appreciate uh, the rocky intertidal for, for research. But people from all over the United States are conducting research um, and using our rocky intertidal areas and our rocky shoreline uh, as their own little of experiments. Um, so we have a lot of research and it's critical opportunity and easy access opportunity for monitoring and research. What's more over, it's 41% of our shoreline. So approximately 41% of Oregon's coast is rocky habitat and rocky shoreline. A lot of us think of our beaches and how significant our beaches are, um, but we have a large portion of our coast that is rocky substrate. And when we start to think about who's involved in managing this, it gets quite complicated. It is, as a former colleague of mine would say, um, an alphabet soup of acronyms. Uh, depending on whether or not you're talking about the plants underwater or on the shore above the vegetation line or below the vegetation line or attached to a rock um, or whether it's flying through the air, you might be dealing with six, seven, eight different agencies that are responsible for managing those resources or regulating the activities in those areas. Um, so there's a whole smorgasbord of interest beyond just people um, when it comes to agencies that are responsible for regulating the activities in and around the rocky habitat areas. So that's why we have something called a territorial sea plan, um, which is a fancy name for um, a, a coastal zone plan is what they call it in many other states. Um, the territorial sea is that zero to three mile strip along Oregon's shoreline. Uh, and that's where the state has authority uh, to regulate um, and to guide uh, ocean uh, resources and ocean activities. Um, adopted in 94, it's our coordinated vision for ocean resource management, and, and that's all under what you heard goal 19 from Andy earlier describing. And it really helps guide our agencies in managing resources um, and the public trust, both our state agencies, but also our federal agencies. Um, we have what's called enforceable policies. These are significant for the state of Oregon. Enforceable policies are allow allow us jurisdiction um, at the state level and, and give us standing with the federal government on federal projects. So these are pretty important for us. Um, and much of the territorial sea plan was really a first attempt at ecosystem-based management. Um, long before that word was a buzzword and long before we were talking about marine protected areas and marine reserves uh, as a management tool, we were thinking about ecosystem-based management through our territorial sea plan. Uh, and we were doing that in sort of some unique ways. So really, when you think about our territorial sea plan, the whole thing is a coordinated strategy for how to operate the rules of the sea and the public trust um, that is in the sea, balancing both the protection and the uses of those resources. Part three is dedicated entirely to rocky habitats. So what did part three do? Part three made some management recommendations. In total, it, it identified 91 major areas of rocky habitat along the Oregon coast. It put them into six different kind of management buckets. Um, marine gardens, which were important areas for, for sort of education. Research reserves, which were important for research. Habitat refuges, which were really aimed at, at conservation. Um, there were priority offshore rocks and reefs that were identified, but a little not exactly categorized or designated the same way um, as, as some of those former uh, designations. We actually had a designation, confusing enough, called not yet designated. That was actually a designation category. Uh, and marine shores was another designated cate uh, designation category. So in 1994, you had these six management categories and you had 91 sites up and down the coast. It was more or less the inventory of where we have rocky habitat along the shoreline um, and some of these priority offshore rocks and reefs and it accounted for them all. 
So what does all this look like in practice? Let's just kind of do a quick warm up of this. Um, the trivia style, I'll give you an idea. That was a lot of mumbo jumbo and a lot of jargon. Um, if you've seen one of my presentations before, you've probably seen this before as well. Um, this, this was, I think, first presented a couple of State of the Coasts ago um, by uh, the, 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 the previous uh, uh, Deanna, the, the previous to Moses here in this position. But um, this is a great way to sort of envision what do these designation categories look like and how does the territorial sea plan work for part three? So what is this rocky spot? Just think in your head, you can name it in the chat if you know that rocky spot. All right, that's your Quinnahead Outstanding Natural Area and Marine Garden. Now the upland area is owned uh, and managed by the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, the Marine Garden itself and a lot of the intertidal area there is under the jurisdiction of both parks and recreation, but also um, some of ODF and W. Um, and when we really look at uh, the number of different jurisdictions and designations there, you would look to the, the TSP, or the Territorial Sea Plan, to see how these different interests manage that area. So um, this marine garden is um, deemed a, uh, an outstanding natural area and is managed by the Bureau of Land Management in coordination with other state agencies. So what about this one? It's a familiar rock for many of you. one of the earlier, not the first, but one of the earlier marine gardens on the Oregon coast. This is um, Haystack Rock up off of Cannon Beach. Uh, it is a marine garden, but also those offshore rocks are US Fish and Wildlife Refuge. Um, so those are wildlife refuges off, off, just off the shore there. So that's managed uh, in cooperation with um, the US Fish and Wildlife, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and even Cannon Beach plays a role in that Haystack Rock Awareness Program, which is an interpretive program um, around the marine garden. So uh, again, the TSP sort of helps guide and show and demonstrate who's involved in those designations partnerships and how those different rules, regulations and activities are coordinated. Name that rocky spot. All right, that one's three arch rocks. This one's detached, it's not attached to the land. So this is a managed as a national wildlife refuge by US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, the territorial sea plan puts in place a special management area around that that has some seasonal closures and other types of recommendations for activities. So again, the role of the TSP here is it helps coordinate some interests like the State Marine Board, Coast Guard and others who may also have an interest and how management occurs at that wildlife refuge. All right, last one. Super cool giant cave on the end of this mammoth landmass that just sticks out. Cape Lookout State Park. Interestingly enough, this is one that was recommended back in 1994 as a habitat refuge, not to be confused with a wildlife refuge. Um, was never fully implemented, but it, it is managed as a state park in the upland area by Parks and Recreation Department. So why would we update the territorial sea plan? Um, well, first of all, it had been nearly 30 years. So back in the mid 90s, you can imagine things were a lot different. They looked a lot different. In fact, the, on your far left side of the screen there is what a map um, of seal rock, a habitat map looked like in 1994. This is actually part of the territorial sea plan. Um, Seal Rock was fit into one of those categories of not yet designated, but you can see how highly sophisticated our mapping was at that time. Um, again, uh, we've come a long way. So today, I mean, in 2013, we have updated shore zone aerial photography. We have high definition imagery all up and down our coast. We have CMEX um, habitat mapping and classifications. Um, tons and tons of citizen science and other types of monitoring surveys, um, a lot of information to help us make better decisions about area based management um, than these, you know, black and white uh, Xerox copies uh, that we were using back in 1994. So we've come a long ways for technology with science. We've learned a lot about um, the shoreline. Um, ocean uses have changed in that time. They've grown. Um, so there's a lot of good reasons why we need to update the territorial sea plan 
Um, in addition to the public asked the Ocean Policy Advisory Council, there was a, a concerted effort by a number of uh, groups, um, in particular Coast Watch in, in Oregon Shores reached out and wanted to see the, the, this part of the plan updated. And so that was one of the things that really got OPAC to queue um, and start this process three years ago. Another reason is, you know, 30 years ago, we didn't have marine reserves. We didn't have marine protected areas. We weren't managing a lot of other rocky habitat areas um, in our shoreline. So the extent of this TSP was it. Um, now we have other regulations. Uh, we have other, you know, uh, marine reserves. We have marine reserves um, like the one at Cape Perpetua that overlaps an existing um, research reserve at Neptune State Park. Uh, we have some research reserves that are different than other marine research reserves. So it's, it's gotten busy with designations and it's gotten a little bit confusing. So that's another good reason why it was good to take a fresh eye at this and see what types of management are we doing today? And how do we wanna be coordinated when we do this into the future? So what did the update look like? What does the update process look like? I'm trying to smash three years here into this uh, presentation and I'm leaving out a lot, but um, mainly because public process isn't all that exciting, I realize sometimes for folks. So um, the beginning of this was really public scoping. I'll talk a little bit about what that was. Um, the next phase was really updating the text, which is the strategy, the policies, um, the coordinating sort of components. Um, and then drafting that and putting that out for public comment, uh, as well as developing a public proposal process for designations. Um, that was sort of the, the three different phases of this process that we've gone through. Um, we kicked it off with public scoping, really to ask the public, what is it about the Rocky Habitat that you care about? What are the changes that you see needed? What are the activities you like there? And what are the major threats? And so, some of the theme themes that we heard from the public, um, this was a pretty massive campaign. It spanned the course of about 2018. There was a social media campaign, there was a survey. We built a story map that helped guide people through the different types of designations. Um, and we had essentially three different surveys that we ran, but we found out that these places are still critical to people and learning. Um, access uh, is, is really important for a number of different groups and a number of different folks in these areas. Um, particularly for education and research, that was some of the loudest voices that we heard that these areas are really critical for those, those types of uses. We heard a lot about a lack of site consistency and some confusion. Uh, folks tended to know what a marine garden was, but people were confused with what a habitat refuge was. Understandably, they didn't understand the difference between that and a wildlife refuge. The, the types of designations, remember those six different categories were confusing and people didn't quite understand them. People were getting concerned about increases in uses and visitation, so more tourism, um, some of that being a little NIMBY, some of that being concerned about wildlife disturbance and degradation, some of that being concerned about safety, um, sort of ran across the board there. So with increased uses and visitation, we saw a number of different concerns that sort of popped up in our public scoping. You know, climate and resiliency was not even a word in the territorial sea plan before. Uh, so we had a lot of overhauling and updating to do to really look at this through a new climate lens and really think about what is management and what is holistic management look like um, in the face of climate change and resiliency, knowing what we know today about everything from ocean chemistry um, to the types of storms and sea level rise that we'll see over the years. Lastly, we heard the public ask for a process for public designations. Um, they wanted to see a way for them to, to designate marine gardens or conservation areas. Uh, we had yet to really develop a clear process for that. Uh, and the way that it had happened in the past was really through a concerted effort um, led by state agencies and, and the strong initiative of those um, with a will um, in certain communities. Following that, uh, we did our sort of uh, policy and text updates. This is, you know, a, a pretty significant document that coordinates our state agencies and, and these policies really matter um, when it comes to what's enforceable, what's up, upheld by law in the long run. Um, and also the purview of the strategy. So these were some things, uh, some of the key takeaways and updates um, that took up really the span of the course of 2019. 
uh, was doing these policy updates. So we included subtitle habitats. Um, subtitle habitats weren't exactly connected or attached in the TSP before. So we had made a clean break uh, in the inner title. It was actually called the Rocky Shore Zone or Rocky Shoreline um, TSP Part 3. Uh, we recognize that um, you know, there, there may be some, some habitat classifications there for, for subtitle versus intertitle. Uh, however, these areas are inexplicably connected when it comes to management and we consider them all together. So um, uh, subtitle habitats were included as, as a potential for designation. We streamlined the designation categories. So there weren't so many of them and they weren't so confusing. I'll, I'll talk about that in just a minute. We improved our enforceable policies, and this is significant. This is what gives Oregon standing in federal processes and in, and in federal projects that may be happening in our territorial sea. Um, Oregon just had a really huge decision or a federal decision around Jordan Cove, um, and all of that related to some enforceable policies um, and some consistency at the state level. So these sorts of policies really matter. What were those? Um, in particular, we put in some, some strong habitat protections for rocky reefs. Uh, and we included submerged aquatic vegetation in a new policy as well. Um, that was certainly, uh, it's, it's a buzzword um, and certainly something that uh, is, was of high interest to the public in our public scoping. So we worked on a policy there. A lot of updating around climate adaptation, resiliency and, and some ecosystem-based management strategies. Um, the development of the digitized Rocky Habitat Inventory, I think that's probably one of the most significant things that's come out of this process to date. Um, you know, back in the, in the early days of submitting proposals, even when I think about marine protected areas uh, and marine reserves and all of what that process was, I mean, people were hand drawing maps um, and drawing on pen and paper. Uh, we have the ability now to, you know, map areas um, and catalog a lot of data um, that's in these areas for, for proposals. So some, some really significant work that's been done there. And, and we've started a process now for public designations. Uh, and that's what we're in the middle of. Uh, and uh, I'm going to turn it over here in a second to Moses, who's going to talk a little bit more about um, that Rocky Habitat inventory tool. And then sort of this process for public designations, kind of what's coming in. Um, and uh, what the future maybe holds for that. Um, just quickly before we move forward and I turn it over to, to, to Moses, I wanted to mention again, um, this is the new sort of streamlined categories of Rocky Habitat designation. Um, and, and we're talking about the green ones. We're not talking about the, the orange, the marine reserve. Um, but you'll remember I had a slide up before that had six different categories. And in, in, in our public scoping, we really learned that one, there were some inconsistencies there. Two, many of them were never implemented. Uh, and three, the public was confused by them. So we have these new designation categories um, and you can think of them in, in, in a range of regulations, but they, they range from marine research area, um, which can have very little um, other than coastwide regulations, but that's targeted at a research goal. Uh, those areas are really designed um, with the interest of a researcher and maybe protecting a type of species or a potential project that's been under certain, been underway for a certain period of time um, that they wouldn't want to be impacted by one activity or another. Marine garden, the goal really around those, we also call them education areas. Um, people were so familiar with the name, we decided not to get rid of that name. But the goal really is keeping an intact ecosystem um, by limiting some invertebrate harvest in those areas. Um, but really with the goal around education. And so you'll see management prescriptions there and around marine gardens that look like that. Um, marine conservation areas was really supposed to be like a marine reserve. It was supposed to be the um, highest level of protection with conservation being the, the, the sole goal of that designation category. Um, we did allow for flexibility. It's the only category that um, the, the, the working group decided we would allow for some flexibility in the types of management prescriptions, um, which may, as we're learning, um, have backfired a little bit on us in, in the public proposal process. But uh, that's, that's, to, that's all part of the learning and the initial proposal process um, for us to learn with. So with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Moses to kind of jump into this Rocky Habitat inventory and proposal tool, its purpose, and then kind of demo it, because I think that's what people will be 
interested in, and then we can do some Q and A from there. Well, thank you, Charlie. Uh, so with that new proposal process that, that Charlie was uh, explaining there, uh, the draft strategy as we have updated it, so that Rocky Habitat Management Strategy, uh, outlines a new process by which members of the public can uh, submit proposals to designate changes in management at some of these rocky sites that we've been talking about. Uh, so these pro uh, proposals can come in the form of addition of a, a new designation at a site, uh, deletion or removal of an existing designation at a site, uh, or a change or a modification or adaptation of an existing site. Uh, at a rocky habitat site. So the new updated rocky habitat management strategy outlines a proposal process uh, using our new rocky habitat web mapping tool, which I'm um, be happy to give you a live demonstration of here in a moment. Uh, you can see a picture of it there on the slide. And it contains a wealth of curated coastal resource data and information, uh, likely some, some data sets that many of you have contributed to. Uh, the, the tool incorporates uh, site mapping, so it's a little bit of a familiar layout uh, that you might have seen many times like Google Maps or something else. Uh, so it, it incorporates that site mapping uh, plus um, all the data information, plus uh, some uh, discussion forums, plus the new pro digital proposal form that we've crafted for this process. So it kind of wraps everything that you would need in this process. Uh, together into one uh, one tool, one one digital pr web presence uh, to facilitate that. So uh, it's a great opportunity for the public to contribute directly to coastal management decision making uh, with the Oregon Coastal Management Program. Whereas previously, uh, as Charlie kind of outlined there, these these decisions for what sites get designated, how and how they're managed. You know, this would have only been done uh, when when uh, the, the territorial sea plan is kind of cracked open for an update uh, and then sealed again for for, you know, however many decades. And uh, that doesn't really fit well with our, our current understanding of of adaptive management and ecosystem based management. And, and you know, also thinking about uh, how much we've learned in the last 30 years about marine spatial planning So uh, to really uh, update the our management of rocky sites, we really need to pull that process out of uh, the, the more uh, kind of dry policy document and, and open it up for adaptive management for the future and include the public, the local communities and organizations and individuals uh, in that process. So uh, we have two opportunities essentially that have been uh, designed for uh, proposal submissions from the public. So one of them has already passed. Uh, that was our initial proposal period. And this took place the latter half of 2020. So last year, uh, it closed on, on December 31st on New Year's Eve. And so right now we're in the process of um, going through at the, all the proposals that we received. There's 12 proposals. Uh, going through and evaluating all those materials. It was a tremendous amount of materials. I think a little more than we were even expecting is over 1300 pages of materials uh, that we need to go through and evaluate one by one uh, and then forward on for recommendation and potential adoption uh, eventually uh, to update site management at some of our sites along the coast. Uh, the second opportunity, which is really a better opportunity uh, to submit proposals, is the maintenance, what we're calling right now the maintenance proposal period. Uh, and this is at the conclusion of our, our project uh, later this year at the end of September. Uh, so October 1st of this year, we'll open it up for this open, ongoing, rolling submission process uh, that'll kind of have a, a little bit of an annual structure to it where you submit and then it gets reviewed and evaluated and, and potentially recommended every year. And so really what that does is um, it kind of opens up uh, future years for this adaptive management strategy so that um, you know, when you uh, or your local community raises a concern, uh, there's a little bit better direct process to have that addressed for the public. And that will be an ongoing uh, indefinite process into the future, potentially decades. Uh, so whenever the next time is uh, that the territorial sea plan needs to be updated for how we manage rocky sites. 
So uh, the proposal uh, recommendation evaluation process, I just wanted to touch on that to help folks understand how that works a little bit, the structure behind it. Uh, so those two different uh, processes, that pilot process, the initial proposal process is on top there. The, the more ongoing uh, indefinite process, the maintenance process on the bottom, they're essentially the same. Uh, there's only one step that's, that's really different uh, but I'll walk you through uh, real quick here on top, the initial process here, the, the Chevron on the left, the, the public, uh, that's you, you build a, pr a proposal for uh, modifying management at a particular rocky habitat site along the coast and submit that to the Oregon Coastal Management Program. The and agencies that are involved in the Oregon Coastal Management Program and in the Rocky Habitat process will evaluate the proposals initially uh, to see if they're complete. And if, if the things that are being proposed are, are feasible, sensible, manageable, implementable, these kinds of, uh, of, of initial um, sniff test or, or passing the bar to, can we actually do this? this is this something we can really consider doing? Once that's been done, then we pass it along to our Rocky Habitat Working Group, uh, who's been shepherding this process uh, from the beginning. And so the Rocky Habitat Working Group, uh, they conduct a, a more detailed merit-based evaluation of the proposals that come in, and they craft initial recommendations. Uh, for the Ocean Policy Advisory Council or, or OPAC. And, the, and that council, OPAC, that's the governor's advisory body for managing ocean resources in the state of Oregon. Uh, so the, the Rocky Habitat Working Group, kind of a subgroup of OPAC that's been constructed for this process. So they'll make their recommendations to OPAC. OPAC will then do a similar recommendation or evaluation process and come up with uh, their recommendations uh, from the recommendations that were forwarded to them. And their recommendations, OPACs, will go to uh, the Land Conservation and Development Commission. I know there's a lot of, uh, a lot of words here, a lot of uh, acronyms, but the Land Conservation and Development Commission, they're the commission uh, that is the actual uh, legislative, or not legislative, the actual rulemaking body uh, for the state of Oregon for, for these issues. And so there will be kind of the, the final uh, test, the final bar to pass. Uh, for implementation of some of these sites. And so they will review the recommendations from the council and decide whether or not uh, which ones to implement and adopt into rule. So in the future, our maintenance process, it'll look pretty similar, except that our working group uh, will be uh, functionally dissolved uh, because this project won't be ongoing, but uh, the, the council may decide to reconstitute working groups at any time to kind of assist with that evaluation process. So where we're at right now, uh, on the top bar there, you see that the little flag that says present. So right now we're in the middle of that, that working group evaluation process. So we're going through them one by one, uh, you know, evaluating the merits of them and preparing to make some recommendations to the council uh, who will meet, uh, they meet twice a year, once in the spring and once uh, at the end of the year. Uh, so they typically will meet in May. Uh, so that's what we're anticipating this year, likely mid-May. And uh, they will, we're preparing to send our recommendations to them and, and then they will uh, in May uh, evaluate and send their recommendations on to the commission, uh, which meets every few months. And so we're thinking uh, possibly a September uh, commission meeting might be when some of these new sites uh, get implemented. Although a little bit of that remains to, to be determined. So then for that maintenance process, it's just gonna be ongoing uh, rolling submissions since the council meets twice a year, we'll have to line it up with their schedule. So if you're interested in uh, this process and participating and potentially something you want to keep in the back of your mind for the future during that maintenance phase, uh, that you have a site in mind that you think might be deserving of, of special management or special protection, uh, we have created the Rocky Habitat web mapping tool. And I'm going to switch screens here real quick to, to the site and I'll walk you through it. All right, everyone can see my screen there, hopefully. So what I've pulled up here is our Rocky Habitat web mapping tool. If you wanna to get to it, this URL here, uh, you know, that's not gonna be very helpful, uh, but um, maybe uh, Charlie or Andy in there can drop the link in there. It's oregon.csketch.org. 
And this is built on a platform uh, called C-Sketch. And this is a team out of UC Santa Barbara. Uh, this platform for C-Sketch is used for all kinds of marine spatial planning applications all around the world. Uh, they, they tailor their, uh, the, their platform to your particular project. So it's, it's very flexible, very adaptable to, to your particular project goals. So that's what the Oregon Coastal Management Program has done here. Uh, we've constructed this tool. You can see a map window on the left and then our kind of function tabs on the right. And the first function tab I want to point you towards is this data layers tab. And there's a couple of sub tabs under here. So I have a, I have a base map here and I'm going to zoom out because I'm, I'm zoomed in on Cape Kiwanda right now, one of my favorite places uh, growing up especially. So I have uh, an aerial imagery, satellite imagery. So if you've ever used uh, Google Maps, you've probably done something similar to this. You say, oh, I don't want the satellite view, I want the street view. Well, we have different base maps ready, prepared for you that you can use to visualize uh, your rocky sites however you want. Uh, we have to topographic maps, uh, oceanographic maps, and so on. So in the data layers, uh, this is where you are going to be able to find uh, the curated data and information uh, that we've prepared for the tool. So there's actually quite a bit uh, in here. So there's a, there's a folder tree here, which uh, you're likely familiar with this, this setup. Uh, and our top level categories here are human, physical, and biological. So within these, you'll find many, many subfolders and data layers. Uh, I, I can't even tell you how many there are at this point, but it's quite a lot. Um, and so you can go through and so I'll turn on some of these and show you really uh, how they work, how it helps you visualize uh, information on the tool. So uh, some of the ones I always like to pull up, obviously the Rocky Habitat Managed Areas. So let me get away from Cape Quanta here, even though we do have one there, but uh, we have quite a number of uh, sites. So you see these uh, little colored shapes or polygons on the map. So now that I've turned that layer on, they pop on and off the map. So if I'm zoom in down here, uh, we can see this little orange hashed area and I can click on it and it tells me a little bit of metadata information about what that site is. So this is the Boiler Bay Research Reserve or now Marine Research Area is what it'll be. And this one down here, that's the Pirate Cove Research Reserve. And so we have this, the entire inventory of our site-specific rocky habitat management is visualized uh, on this data layer in the tool. So here we also have the Whale Cove Habitat Refuge and, and so forth. Uh, you can also look to see, uh, you know, where are the state parks? So those are those green areas that just popped up there. Uh, you can look at the Oregon Marine Reserves and Marine Protected Areas. This is a really useful one. And you know, some of these, I, I, when I'm using the tool, I have some of these data layers on uh, all the time. Um, there's, I'll look at a few here under physical. Uh, another useful one is the Oregon Mean High Water Shoreline. Uh, so this is the shoreline that we, is generally referenced in, in a lot of the, the Rocky Shore documentation and, and policies. Uh, we can also pull up, um, you know, uh, Charlie mentioned the CMEX layer. So this one is, is really interesting to see. Uh, just got put in uh, uh, last year. And when we pull it up, if it'll load, sometimes it takes a while. There we go. So now we can see um, kind of this different shading here. And this corresponds to uh, different substrate types or different habitat types, depending on how you want to call it but it could be um, you know, different classifications of rocky substrate uh, or it could just be sand uh, or other. So um, that can be really useful if you're trying to um, you know, draw a box around a site and determine where the boundaries of that box or that polygon need to be to make sure that you're including appropriately the kinds of habitat uh, that you're interested in and not the other kinds of habitat that aren't relevant. Uh, we also have some aerial imagery layers. I'm not going to turn them on right now. They tend to bog down my system a little bit, uh, but much higher resolution aerial imagery than what you see on that base map there. So those can be extremely useful uh, for the, depending on the application. And in biological here, I'm going to jump down. We have, uh, we can visualize some things like nesting seabird colonies um, 
and black oyster catchers. So you see all those little dots popping up there. Those are those uh, seabird layers that I'm turning on. Uh, we also get uh, some air, we also have some areas related to whales or pinniped haulouts. So all the seals and sea lions uh, that, that uh, find some of these rocky areas for pupping, uh, they can be really sensitive to disturbance. So this will help you kind of understand uh, where, those, where those are. So once you've kind of curated uh, the, the data layers that you want for your site, uh, you can go to this little toolbar here and it has some other mapping tools that might help you understand uh, the area that you wanna designate. Um, so you can, uh, there's a scale bar and uh, coordinates, uh, measurement tools, you can measure distance, you can measure area, uh, a, a great deal of, of helpful information there. So once you've kind of uh, got that down, you can um, you look through the legend here on this sub tab and that will help you kind of rearrange some of your data layers, help you visualize them better, change the transparency on some of them. You can see here the, the marine reserve and protected area boxes are quite large. Uh, so I, I tend to turn the transparency up on those a little bit, helps me out. And you can go to the My Plans tab and the My Plans is where you have, this is your sandbox, your sketch, pad uh, where you can draw areas on the map to designate them uh, for protection. So if we go down to a rocky area, let's say down here by Otter Rock, uh, I, can, I can create a new uh, designated area right here in the My Plans tab and I can just say, uh, I'll say Rocky Creek because that's where we're at uh, pretty much. So Rocky Creek, uh, what kind of designation do I want it to be? Um, you know, I'll say a marine research area. And then you can click on the map here, and then you can just start drawing uh, an area around the site that you want to protect. And don't be too concerned about your landward side because, uh, as you'll see here in just a moment, once you've uh, you know closed the the loop on your polygon, uh, the system will calculate it for a minute, and then it'll clip that polygon to that dark blue line, which was that Oregon Mean High Water Shoreline. Uh, that I showed you in the data layers. So here now is the site uh, that I just drew very, very quickly, very roughly around this site. And uh, then what I can do is if I'm not happy with it, I say, well, I don't think it makes sense. I don't need to go this far out offshore. We are only concerned about the rocky habitats. I can just click on it again and it'll show me all of the little nodes that I can move around here to really uh, uh, get better uh, boundaries on this site. Uh, so it makes a little bit more sense. So you can get pretty precise here. The more you kind of click around on these, the more they kind of add new ones for you to modify it. And then you can save your plan uh, once you feel like it's, it's appropriate for the site. So there's a couple here that I've, I've made. Um, you know, I, I had this Cape Kowanda one pulled up. Of course, we already have a marine garden at Cape Kowanda, uh, but you know, just to give you an example of what these polygons look like and how precise you can, uh, or detailed, you can really get their boundaries to make sure that, that it's appropriately capturing uh, the habitat that we want. And finally, uh, we have a discussion forum here. I post some announcements on occasion, uh, and uh, we can also have uh, discussion forums for different groups who are crafting proposals. You can ask OCMP staff a question, or just there's general discussion forums. And down at the bottom where it says surveys, we have our Rocky Habitat site designation proposal form. And so this proposal form, there's some information here, some links to some resources to help people uh, who are crafting proposals or, or thinking about crafting a proposal. And once you're ready, you can click start a new proposal, and then it will walk you through all the questions and prompts that you we're requesting for uh, designation of a new site. And so this can take some time and a lot of planning. Uh, and, and the folks who have crafted proposals for us, it's very clear there was tremendous effort made uh, to get those proposals to us. So, and then once you're done, you can say, click on submit response at the bottom there and it comes to us. And then the clock starts ticking on that eva those evaluation processes that I showed you. So. I'm going to step back here real quick. We're almost out of, done. Um, and I just wanted to point out as well before uh, um, I forgot 
our other website, OregonOcean.info, has a kind of a collection of our ocean management information. So this has to do with ocean policy, the council, the territorial sea plan, uh, ocean acidification and hypoxia, and many other issues in case you're looking for where to find that information. So hopefully that gives you a, a better sense of what the kinds of things we're talking about, the resources uh, that are available to you, uh, you know, and, and moving forward, what, what does this really mean for the future? Well, to kind of recap and reiterate, what it, what it really means is uh, we've crafted this public process, you know, that's not set in stone. It's, it's really something that brings the public together. Uh, it's something that uh, looking forward to the future that maybe 10, 20, 30 years or more from now, uh, it, conditions change, uh, populations change, site use changes that we can say, hey, you know what, uh, what we have, the way we're managing a particular site right now doesn't make sense for conditions now. It makes sense for conditions decades ago. Uh, but not right now. So really what we need to do is we need to rally our, our local communities around us, uh, figure out, uh, you know, get them to express the concerns and understand uh, how this site really needs to be managed uh, to, to fit well with, with uh, the concerns of today and not just yesterday and the concerns that we see for the future. And so that's really the adaptive management component of this process uh, that we're trying to focus on and, and really trying to drive home here. So uh, that's that's where we've landed. Um, so are there any comments or questions? I've seen lots of chats popping up. I haven't had a chance to look at them yet, though. Yeah, I was going to say, Andy, do you want to work through a couple of those questions that you were responding to and maybe give a little bit more detail? Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, and thanks for the great questions. Uh, the, the first uh, question um, was, where did the C-Sketch software come from? And this, um, it, you know, our C Sketch instance is one of a number of uh, kind of software instances that have been developed around the world uh, by uh, the University of California Santa Barbara um, kind of team that developed the original program. Uh, many of you might remember uh, Oregon Marine Map, which was kind of the forebear of um, of this program. So the same team that built that software system, uh, which has since become obsolescent, uh, you know, we you know recognize the, the the value of the development there, and we paid to have uh, the site developed for our purposes um, here. And really, you know, a lot of the time and effort was spent. Uh, building the customized reports that are available when somebody draws uh, an area of interest on the map and then clicks, you know, get a report, you know, they helped do the programming on the back end that helps to run those geospatial analysis queries. Uh, we provide them with the data and kind of the information that we'd like back, but uh, it requires computer software engineers to, to make that happen. One of the other questions I had was, uh, you know, what is the process for updating uh, layers like the coastal marine ecological classification intertidal substrate layer, which is what uh, Moses demonstrated. Um, that layer of information was generated through a grant uh, funded by our state geospatial enterprise office is as part of the framework data development program. And framework as a whole is designed to help the state develop a data infrastructure that's important for um, information that's crucial to the function of multiple agencies together. So uh, we have a coastal and marine kind of data framework team, but there are other framework teams around the state that that work on things like collection of aerial imagery or the coordination of transportation information. So, you know, we as, as a coastal and marine data producing community received funds to help build uh, that specific layer. As a framework data layer, we are committing to updating and maintaining that as additional data becomes available. Um, and in addition to the inner title, uh, CMEX data layer, there's a whole collection of, of estuarine habitat data layers that we as a program built um, through other grants uh, earlier, but um, 
you know, our goal is to kind of stitch together uh, those data sets from the, the intertidal out on the rocky shore um, and connect them with our estuary related information. Great, that's good to hear, Andy, because I worked on that project a little bit, so it's nice to hear. Um, it's still alive and it's still <laughs> being used. That's great. Um, Charlie, there's some questions about um, the work that's been done to put in some of those uh, original proposals for changes and kind of your gut response and feel on how that's moving forward and whether um, there might be folks um, that are pushing back on that. Can you just kind of give us a read on those proposals and how that process is moving forward? And the question I'm referring to that I kind of butchered and I'm sorry, Dennis, is Dennis White's question. Yeah, I think there's a lot wrapped up in that. Um, one, I would say um, we, we've never done this before. Um, you know, we were pen and paper um, area-based management proposals uh, 10 years ago. Um, so we're trying to create a new process and we haven't figured it all out yet. This is the initial proposal process and it's we're ironing it out. And so I think there's actually been less controversy in what has been proposed and there's been more controversy around how we develop that process. Um, so that's actually been quite challenging for the working group uh, because the working groups really wanted to focus on a, a process. Um, I think as we move into the future, I, I you know, m Moses mentioned this, is that we're going to learn. Uh, we're not going to get things all perfect in the first process. And gosh, we've got 12 proposals um, uh, in our, our first process to try and figure out and wade our way through. So I, I think it'll be the start of a conversation for a lot of things. Um, I, I actually see this as more of an opportunity to build bridges and to, to build opportunities for solutions uh, and site-specific management in our rocky habitat um, by depoliticizing it. You know, in the future, there won't be a working group process. Um, people could iteratively work you know, with state agencies and small teams of scientists or whoever um, through, a, through the tool. Uh, and the goal is to really not have that go through a politicized process. Um, I think right now, though, it's a lot of learning. So we can't expect it all to get perfect right now. But I don't think that there's a lot of opposition to, to some of the proposals and, and the ideas of folks. It's just a lot for us to figure out at once. And it's new. Um, so we're, 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 we're trying to wade through that. Um, and it, it'll be, I guess I should mention, at the end of this month, the working group will be making their recommendation to the Ocean Policy Advisory Council. So there will be a public meeting um, where the working group will be kind of working through these 12 different proposals. But I think moving forward, um, there's a great opportunity to bridge build here um, and less drive opposition um, around these sites. So quick follow-up question, Charlie. Um, maybe Moses can talk about this. In that participant um, tab on the tool, is there a place to see where other proposals have been put in? So you can kind of see um, the activity around a particular area? Yeah, uh, in the announcements forum here, uh, once, the, once the proposals came in and, and we were able to process all of it, um, I did uh, make them available to view on the tool. So uh, you can, uh, pull them up, you know, I can turn it on, I can zoom straight to it. So there's one site that was proposed. And uh, so you can actually, uh, then you could copy this to your plans, to, to your sketch box um, to, or sandbox to play with. And so uh, you could use any of these. So let's say uh, something didn't, didn't make it through the process, but uh, folks wanna try again, because you know, a lot of these sites have a tremendous amount of interest around them. So you could take something that somebody else did and try and modify it, or you can just play around with it for fun as well. Uh, in addition, on organocean.info, uh, on the front page here, uh, we usually post our updates right at the top. Uh, so we put links to all the proposal materials there as well, if folks want to uh, peruse all that information. Great, thank you very much, Moses. We're getting a couple of questions about the different categories that are now in the new territorial sea plan um, and whether any of those four categories that we collapse the six down to the four include, include places for foragers. 
So I don't know if it's Charlie or Andy. I can I can answer that question. Um, and by foraging, foraging, I assume you mean harvest of any kind. Um, so presumably there's harvest allowed in all designation categories. It's limited um, in some more than others, um, but um, uh, presumably there's there's no there's there's a there's varied harvest opportunities in each. And I, I could share my screen and show you the different categories and what the harvest restrictions are, if you would like. So Charlie, why don't you pull that up? And then um, Andy, was there any other questions that you, you kind of been following along that we wanted to answer uh, verbally? No, I, I think I answered them through the chat, thanks. Great. Okay, Charlie, you want to take us through what you're sharing with us? Sure. So I think the it might have been from from Gail who mm -hmm. had asked this question specific, maybe potentially to algae harvest. And so, commercial and recreational take of algae would not be allowed in both a marine garden and a marine research area. Um, and a marine conservation area, you could establish rules that allowed for algae harvest. Marine conservation, ironically, allows for variable types of harvest restrictions to be proposed. Um, but at a base level right now, algae, um, it, there is no take uh, for both commercial and recreational in both categories of marine garden and marine research area. Yeah. Um, so I, I think maybe that was specific to the question. Now, with we, when you get into invertebrates and fish, it's it's varied. Both marine gardens and research areas allow for fishing. Um, marine conservation areas is is the only area that that one could propose no fishing regulations. Um, and then when it comes to invertebrate harvest, uh, there's varied restrictions. They they're a little bit different between um, the the research area and the marine garden. Uh, the marine garden um, still allows for a, a number of species that are popular for um, harvest, but particularly the, um, the, the species, the biogenic species, the ones that are really important, um, there's limited take around those in marine gardens. So for example, you could only take one mussel, um, but you would have greater opportunity for crab in a marine garden, um, given um, they're an essential part of the, the mussels are essential part of the habitat. Um, and then in a research area that is uh, varied, primarily the, the species that one would want to harvest, um, you are allowed to harvest in a marine research area when it comes to invertebrates, but no take on uh, algae for all of those. So um, if somebody wanted to dig into the actual language around some of these um, nuances, Andy, do you want to type in where they might be able to go and actually get the um, changes to the territorial sea on this chapter? Is that public yet? Actually, Moses um, provided the link already. You can just go to OregonOcean.info, and there is a draft of our strategy. If you if you scroll down the page, um, you should be able to read and access the the latest version of our our amendment. And Moses just dumped that link into the chat, so you can go there if you have questions and you want to see a little bit more. Um, we have done a great job of filling time and uh, taking a great amount of information and condensing it down into uh, our hour together. Um, I just wanna thank our presenters, the amount of work that they did um, to make this happen um, for Charlie said the three years, but we know that, that that was a lot of intense work to make this happen. So first of all, I just wanna thank you all um, for your time and your effort to bring this forward and to um, put a focus on our rocky intertidal area in this way. So I wanna thank you for that. And I wanna thank you for your time tonight and sharing with us and making us aware of how we can continue to interact in this process. So thank you very, very much to all three of you. Um, for everybody that's online, if you do need to contact um, anybody that presented, maybe uh, one of you could throw emails into the chat box. Um, if you have questions or concerns. Other than that, I hope we see you next month um, for our Science on Tap with uh, Jack Barth. So thanks everyone. 
Thanks so much for having me. And please do feel free to reach out if folks have any questions. You can see the uh, contact information is now on the screen, everyone. So if you need it, it's there. So thank you for being so transparent and offering that up, Charlie. Appreciate it. And you're seeing all the. And we're happy to share these slides with you. Um, so perfect. Wonderful. And like I said earlier, the recording of this will go up um, on the HMSC past seminar page. So if you needed to see something again, if the things that Moses was showing us went a little too quickly, you're welcome to watch again um, the recording there. And I'm not sure everyone can see the chat, but everyone's telling you thank you so much. Really appreciate your sharing and um, doing the, the virtual hand claps for us. So thanks, everyone. Give everybody thanks, folks. A Have a good evening. All right. Thanks, everyone. Hope to see you next month. And thanks to our three presenters. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to end the meeting Thank now. You.